You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey Vet Rehabbers, today's podcast is a snippet from one of the lectures in our paid membership and it's lectured by Lowry Davies. The webinar is called Fascia, What You Need to Know. Now fascia is something that I heard about first in my anatomy class in my second year when I was doing dissections, but it was never something that was mentioned again in my later years of studying as a vet. Fascia provides structure and support throughout the body and it's an organ which we are still learning a lot about and how it affects movement, posture and pain. So I decided to do a quick search on our online pet health paid membership and we have a fair amount of learning on this topic for those of you that are interested. We've got looking at myofascial trigger points, animal fascial manipulation, a treatment tool, the myofascial link, these are all one hour lectures and then we have a four hour series on, the, on our Ekan membership and that's looking at retraining fascia, muscle and posture and then two research refreshes on the superficial and deep myofascial kinetic lines. So if you're a member you can search and find all these webinars in our extensive library. We now have 196 hours in the small animal membership, 98 hours in our Hydra membership and 130 hours in our Equine membership. So if you're not a member, you can get access to all the, to our free limited access membership and you can go to onlinepetal.com forward slash free. So Lowry Davies owns Smart Referral Centers in Wales. Lowry is one of the reasons that I actually got into vet rehab. In 2003, when I was working in the UK, I read an article that Lowry had published in, I think it was the Veterinary Record, and I contacted her and I said, I want to do what you're doing, and I went down and spent two days with her, and I then straight away booked myself into the CCRP at the University of Tennessee and the rest is history. So I've known Larry for a long, long, long time and she has done amazing things. She's on so many boards. She's a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine. She is on, she's a member of the International Association of the Study of Pain. She's the past president of the British Veterinary Rehabilitation Sports Medicine Association. She has contributed to a number of textbooks on pain management and rehabilitation, as well as authoring The Care of the Canine Athlete. So let's go and find out what we need to know about fascia. Hi, good good day to everybody. I'm not quite sure what time of day you're all listening in. My name is Laurie Davis. I am a veterinary surgeon and I run the Smart Veterinary Centres down in South Wales. I'm a specialist, or two actually, two specialist rehabilitation clinics. And today with this lecture, we're going to look at fascia. And I'm just going to give you a little introductory tour to what is often a hidden or forgotten system within the body. Okay, so... Let's get started. So I'm sure for many of you, um, if your training was anything similar to mine, then um, during my anatomy lectures and also during my orthopedic training, I was taught to look at the body in a very sort of broken down, disjointed manner. So first year of vet school, uh, we got given some cadavers and a scalpel and we had to expose the individual muscles of the body. We looked at their origin and we looked at their insertion and then we looked at their ability as individual muscles or perhaps a muscle group if we're thinking about the quadriceps or the hamstring to move levers i.e. the distal limbs or to keep us supported against gravity. And then moving on from there, once we'd learned about these individual muscles and sort of for many of us forgotten about them, we started to look at lameness um, in this sort of very similar mechanistic sort of disjointed fashion. So we would look at lameness associated with the shoulder joint, lameness associated with the elbow joint, perhaps, or the hip joint. And at no point really did we start to look at lameness or movement as a whole body interactive system. So we tended to think about things as a separate, discrete or robotic movement pattern. So movement is a seamless integration if we 
look at this here, I sort of actually sort of put the dog in water to exaggerate the range of motion. But hopefully you can see that it's much, much more of a wave pattern. So you can't isolate movement of the back leg from movement of the front leg or movement of the back any more than you can isolate movement in sort of the distal phalangeal joints from the, the shoulder joint and um, from the cervical thoracic junction perhaps. So movement propagates along the body in a wave fashion. So really, how does this then fit with our um, training of individual sort of foci, either in terms of muscle or joint function, um, affecting lameness? Because really, it should be, we need to think about it as an interconnected system, because that's the only way that we can make sense of how the body actually moves and performs. So in the living world, movement is a seamless integration of body parts. So when we look at higher levels of movement, such as sort of this dog performing a weave here, again, hopefully the wave motion, the sinusoidal um, type of movement that we're sort of performing here in an exaggerated way, but every day, that every time we take a step in a much less sort of overt fashion, we, this is how we are moving. We're integrating all of our body parts um, to facilitate movement. So when one part of the body moves, the rest flows fluidly behind it. You know, I was out running this morning and uh, living in Wales, you can't avoid the hills. And one of the things that I found when I wanted to run better is that in order to power up the hill, the, the primary driver of movement comes from my arm, it doesn't come from my leg. Um, and I'm actually then using the upper part of the body to drive the lower part of the body forward. So hopefully the sort of say the, the distal part of the body is flowing behind, and though it's providing the sort of the power, it's actually flowing behind the arm. Um, movement sort of put this sort of uh, see-through image of the human body up because it's not just our musculoskeletal and neural system but also our organ systems that are flowing through the body as well perhaps we think of the heart um, lungs kidneys as being rigid but they're not rigid within the body uh, they're constantly moving maybe the lung is the easiest organ to interpret this but with respiration we, we know that sort of we, we get sort of um, expansion and contraction of sort of both the lung tissue and the rib cage but the kidneys move up and down the body wall heart will move around inside the pericardium so when one part of the body moves the rest has to flow fluidly behind it so what what tissue can facilitate this and when we think about it logically then connective tissue is actually the only tissue that can facilitate this functionally it's often known as the forgotten organ and I think there's a number of reasons for this largely um, it's probably based on our inability into very recently to image it correctly I'm very lucky with my ultrasound machine that I sort of got this image from but on the whole, up until very recently, even the resolution of our ultrasound machines wasn't good enough to actually image structures such as the lumbar fascia, which are only two millimeters thick. And even though that was often sort of unintelligible to our traditional diagnostic imaging, um, palpatory, a skilled um, sort of person in palpation could detect about a 20% change in thickness, which is what is thought to happen in back pain cases. So with our sort of fingers, our sensory nerve endings could detect a change, but this was not until very recently available to sort of traditional imaging methods. So if we can't see it, um, then in the traditional veterinary fashion or medical fashion as well, we tend to ignore it. If it's not there, then we can't see it, it can't be the problem. I think then the other sort of problem that we had in terms of recognising the importance of fascia was its perception as being a very disorganised tissue, that it didn't have a structure in the same way as bone. And again, with more sort of refined imaging techniques, we know now that this is sort of, again, an erroneous sort of train of thought. Fascia actually, when it is healthy, is a very organised 
tissue. So improved ultrasound technology, improved histological evaluation has allowed us to sort of sort of pick up on the fascia to sort of see sort of both sort of sort of within the muscle fiber bundles and between the muscle fiber bundles um, we can detect sort of both sort of the myofascia and then sort of intra-abdominally we would also be able to detect sort of the sort of intra-abdominal sort of fascia the peritoneum etc so perhaps another name um, that describes fascia well, it, it ha it's synonymous that we have connective tissue, webbing, a fascial net or a collagenous network. But what all of these terms have in common is they give a sort of an image or an indication of sort of a sort of extended structure so you know we know what fishing net looks like um, and i actually do particularly like this drawing of the body because it sort of shows the body being encompassed by a fascial net which is sort of in very very true representation of the living organism and hopefully we can see that it sort of spans from the head down to the toes we're often i don't know if any of you have suffered from a condition called plantar fasciitis which is sort of traditionally tackled and um, plantar fascia being sort of the fascia under the sole of the foot and we have lots of um, techniques for sort of changing sort of orthotics in our shoes sort of a, a sort of attacking the plantar fascia under the foot but if we want to release the plantar fascia then we have to look not just at the foot we have to look at the calves we have to look at the hamstrings and even further up into the back so again it gives us this indication of a body-wide connective um, tissue network not just something that is localized in one part of the body and this should hopefully start to sort of create the impression that we need to avoid giving these artificial boundaries that we were taught to give by our sort of anatomy um, and physio and sort of medical training so Actually, we need to sort of wipe sort of our sort of image of um, sort of there being 600 muscles within the body um, and perhaps think of it slightly differently. We need to think of it as being one muscle that's just been dropped into sort of 600 different um, pockets, but with all of these sort of muscles being surrounded by fascia that interconnect from the tip of the toe to the top of the head. Okay, so what is this fascial network? Well, again, it can be described as a body-wide tension system, the exact anatomy of which is dependent upon the forces it's subjected to. And I'm very fond of this term that form follows function. So the body, whether it's our body, our canine body, our equine body, or bovine body, what that body does will determine its form. So the function that we subject um, our bodies or our pets to will dictate the responses within the body. Um, now, this can be very easily seen sort of if we sort of go and train a muscle in the gym. If we lift a lot of weights, we can see an appreciable change in our biceps, in our triceps. Depending upon sort of which muscle group we're changing, we can see that the form will change in response to an altered function. Perhaps it's more difficult to see without sort of um, further imaging. But the same is true for our fascia, but it's also true for cortices of our body bones and sort of if we unload or if we disuse in the same way we down regulate function and then form will change as well so we get a down regulation of form if the local tension is mainly in one direction then the connective tissue will become very organized and will reflect this form by forming tendons and ligaments so again you know sort of hopefully we all would have an appreciation of the ordered parallel arrangement of collagen fibers within our tendons and ligaments but if the load is applied in many directions and a slightly lower load at the lig such as that this sort of causes the development of ligaments and tendons then the fascia net is again organized but in a very different way it's much looser and much more like a 3d lattice structure it looks i say like a fishing net and perhaps a better understanding of how important fascia is comes with the realization that muscles actually transmit 40 percent of their contraction force not to their associated tendon but via connect fascial connections into the adjacent movement into the adjacent muscle so force generation power generation within the muscle isn't just a linear thing that flows sort of from top to bottom or sort of distal 
to cranial start to finish of our kinetic chain, however we may wish to describe it, but actually propagates sideways, moves out in a wave-like pattern, which again fits very nicely with what we see when we look um, at movement in an individual organism. So there is a lateral transfer of force. But that lateral transfer of force does not fit our little sort of simplified anatomical dissection model of the muscle because we know that they just go from their origin to their insertion. Um, so we need to look for different structures that can facilitate this lateral propagation of force. And we come back to our connective tissue network. So muscles will transmit up to 40% of their contraction, not into their respective tendon, but via fascial connections to the adjacent muscles. This often involves the antagonist or the co-contractor muscle, which are stiffened and tend to increase resistance to primary movement and then allow this lateral wave of force transmission. And we know now, again, from improved histological dissection, 30% um, of muscle fibres will blend with the fascia. So again, they don't sort of end neatly within sort of at the myotendinous junction, but rather they spread out into the adjacent fascia. And 30% of our movement biomechanics can be attributed to fascial tissue and the work done by the fascial tissue. An important muscle force transmission via fascial connections have been shown to occur in people between the latissimus dorsi and the contralateral gluteus maximus via the lumbar dorsal fascia, the biceps femoris and rectus spiny fascia via the sacral tuberous ligament, the biceps brachii and the flexor muscles of the lower arm, and the gluteus maximus and lower leg muscles via the fascia lata. And there's ongoing work at the moment looking at sort of um, dissection, fascial dissections within sort of the canine. Um, and the equine um, animal, again, sort of to try and establish similar connections. So histologically, um, we can divide the fascia into three layers. But again, here we are, we're now making arbitrary divisions again. And there is some sort of schools of thought within the fascia community that even these um, divisions are actually um, sort of not sort of distinct divisions as well. But again, that sort of it is just one continuum. But sort of for now and for simplification, we can think about the superficial layer, which is the major longitudinal fascia layer in the subcutaneous tissue, which connects with the skin. Then we have a middle layer, which is a much sort of actually looser um, layer where most of the fascial movement occurs. And this is where our uh, tubular structures, be they lymph vessels, be they capillaries, venules and arteries or neural structures are sort of located. And then we have the deep fascia, which is sort of adjacent to the deeper structures, such as the periosteum. And here the collagen fibers are running in a number of directions, forming multiple layers. And again, allows variability for the nerves and vessels to enter the deeper structures of the body. And again, provides tunnels for these tubular structures to glide through. If we look at how fascia is constructed, then basically we have two components, um, a cellular component and an extracellular matrix. The main component of the sort of the cellular part are fibroblasts, and these are involved in matrix secretion. There is also mast cells there, so this tends to suggest that we have an immune action within the fascia we'll find nerves and vessels and then to sort of a very small amount of other cells which have contractile properties and these have been sort of recently discovered um, which does allow a degree sort of, of contraction of active movement within the fascia so we will have myofibrocytes if we then look at the matrix, um, the sort of predominant part of the matrix is water, but then we also have a third, if it's just over a third, is collagenous sort of fibre um, component as well. Now, water is, say, it, it sort of, it's, it's a major component of fascia, but it, it's a highly important component of fascia. So two thirds of the structure is made up of water. And most of this water is pushed out um, during loading, either through stretching or compression, um, and it allows the fascia to adapt. Once we then remove um, the stress on the tissue, then water should move back in and the fascia should rehydrate. And most of this water is bound, so it's charged and 
sort of bound water or charged water has sort of will give the sort of the fascia sort of structure turgidity um so it will it's, it's a bit like being a sort of a plump sort of taut balloon so it pushes it creates space so the charge between the water molecules means they repel each other and they create space within the body tissue and that sort of charge is the important sort of sort of sort of characteristic of fascia of water within the fascia so it's not the amount of water because if you sort of most of you probably if you're doing any manual work will be sort of quite familiar with what sort of oedema fluid sort of in the tissue feels like it certainly doesn't feel like a plump balloon it has a very it's much more like sort of the dough that we use to make bread or the, it has a very soft sort of sort of feel to it and our fingers can sort of will sort of depress into it and there is no resistance in it but there's probably a lot of fluid there and this is very different from sort of the turgid sort of healthy fascia when the molecules are sort of pushing each other apart and one of the main sort of things that we're trying to achieve with manual therapy is that if we have unbound or uncharged water within the fascia we need to get rid of it we need to move it out so we compress or we sort of pr pr produce tension stress on the fascial tissue which then when that's relieved will hopefully allow charged bound water to move in in its place and normalize the structure and create space for movement for the sliding and gliding that the fascia has to do to facilitate sort of normal pain-free body movement so under conditions of inflammation free radicals accumulate we sort of get sort of um, sort of vas increased vascular permeability. We get sort of edema within the tissue. This is bulk water as opposed to bound water. And as we said, we need to move that out um, in order to facilitate sort of healing, repair, and normal fascial sort of activity. So stress the area, squeeze out the bulk water. We get rehydration with healthy bound water. So what influences are, is fascia subjected to? It's a net that's sensitive to both mechanical and biochemical stimulation. So it responds to movement and the sort of mechanistic strain that we put on our body. But it also responds to biochemical stimuli. So inflammatory cytokines, um, prostaglandins, hormones, tissue pH, for example. Um, there's a lot of work now um, being undertaken looking at the collagen response to hormone. And we know that changes in estrogen levels significantly alter the nature of collagen within the body. So it will alter the balance of type 1 to type 3 collagen. So the biomechanical stimulation is critically important. But without biome proper biomechanical stimulation, it doesn't matter how sort of appropriate the biomechanical milieu is, um, it's irrelevant. So if we're not moving, um, then we will not have healthy tissue. So sport and movement therapy is critical for matrix remodeling and fibroblast stimulation. And that's good for us to know as uh, rehabilitation therapists, you know, one of the primary things that we want to do is restore movement as quickly as possible. So what happens when we load connective tissue? So the fibroblasts in response to load can bring about a number of changes in bone density. They can um, respond by altering osteoblastic to osteoclastic balance so that they change our ability to lay down bone as opposed to removing bone from the cortex. It will also lead to rearrangement of the fascial web and hopefully result in forming a clear two-directional lattice. So if you look down here, um, at sort of the, the image on the left hopefully again I've sort of talked a lot about the fishing net but that sort of is a structured ordered lattice with nicely crimped fibers if we looked at the image on the right this is what would happen if we turned into a couch potato we reduce reduce the sort of the load the sort of biomechanical stimulus um, on the collagen fiber and we get disorganization so we get a random um, arrangement of fibers and again if we go back to the image on the left hopefully sort of in the magnified part you can see that the fibers are crimped so that when we move we can flatten out the crimp we can allow the fibers to stretch and in the same way you know again if, if we think sort of on a 
sort of of our about our fishing net it's not sort of it's not like a piece of elastic it doesn't extend indefinitely but if we think that sort of about the diamond sort of nature of the lattice we can lengthen we can elongate the diamond so sort of as these fibers sort of stretch out um, the crimp disappears but that allows a degree of sort of plastic sort of movement a last plastic deformation which live sort of gives us sort of the ability to stretch we then take the sort of the the force away and the crimp sort of restores and we come back to normal sort of architecture but because the fibers are arranged sort of end to end and in an organized fashion we can get lengthening and elongation if you look at the image on the right where we have this completely random um, collagen fiber arrangement you can just imagine that sort of you've got one fiber pulling sort of dorsal ventrally another fiber pulling sort of sort of lateral medially and they're all working against each other they're all opposing each other there is no system so you're going to get sort of a rigid sort of immobile mass of fascia where you've lost the crimp pattern and this is often what happens with scar tissue whether it's in the skin or in the muscle after injury or in the tendon and ligament as well so if we get this very disorganized fascia it becomes very restrictive to normal movement patterns moving up to the image at the top one of the main biomechanical um, stimuli for normal tissue development is gravity so we live in a gravitational field and we our body will respond to that appropriately but if we sort of move out um, into a reduced an environment of reduced gravitational pull so moving into space and then that changes um, the load upon the fascia which in turn changes sort of stimulus to both muscle and bone and proliferation so one of the main problems that astronauts get when they come back to earth is they have osteoporotic bones so the cortical density has been reduced because they have been so the biomechanical stimulus to their body has altered and their body has downregulated its load bearing ability accordingly so they have to be reintroduced into normal activities very gradually other factors that affect fascia is aging so as we age even sort of you know if we keep sort of active it will help but we do tend to lose the bounce or spring in our gait and this is reflected in our fascial architecture unfortunately for women at sort of as they hit sort of the menopause and the hormonal changes in the body that will have a significant effect on the collagen making it weaker less elastic and sort of sort of predisposes towards um, type three collagen rather than type one collagen, which is inferior. So we become inherently stiffer as we age. So sort of unfortunately for us, we're far more exposed to collagen changes than our male counterparts. But by exercising and maintaining load, we can preserve our fascial architecture pretty well into old age. Um, animal experiments have shown that immobilization will quickly lead to dysregulation and multi-directional fiber growth with increased cross linkages and these changes can happen in as short a period of time as a week of complete bed rest so again this highlights the importance of getting our patients up on their feet and moving as quickly as possible talking to um, one of my clients that had a hip replacement and within 24 hours of surgery he was up and moving about and was back sort of walking a significant distance within sort of two to three weeks of the surgery and you contrast this with some of our canine patients that maybe are being told to cage rest for a minimum of six weeks after joint replacement surgery so you know two very different scenarios um, but in order to maximize our sort of post-surgical recovery ideally we want to be putting our connective tissue back under normal biomechanical stimulation as quickly as possible and just to sort of highlight the sort of body-wide tensional force transmission network that the sort of the pressure provides, I thought I would show you this video. Um, so I'd like you to appreciate how well this dog um, that is now sort of doing some um, pretty advanced sort of sheepdog trialing work is moving. Absolute seamless motion sort of 
being able to sort of move in a circle, very, very skilled, high sort of level of um, neuromotor control. And he doesn't sort of falter at all when he turns from left to right. And for the observant among you, you'll see that actually he only has three legs. Um, he has suffered a very nasty injury as a young puppy um, and his body has developed as a tripod. Um, but this isn't sort of one of the problems that we see with later life amputation is they actually become a rocking horse. that They move from, from the back leg to the two front legs um, in a two beat gait pattern. Um, but sort of if sort of we lose sort of the extra limb then we develop as it was never there at all if this happens in the juvenile um and you know and what I suppose what i'm trying to illustrate is that a sort of in contrast to our accepted way of movement which views bones as being pillars that prop us up this dog hasn't got the fourth pillar to prop it up but this dog doesn't need the fourth pillar to prop it up because he's a balanced network of tensional forces as a tripod and he can complete all the activities of daily living in a skilled manner because his sort of tension network system is keeping him in balance and allowing him to move. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. Don't forget to bookmark the next Vet Rehab Summit on Saturday the 4th of November. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference created specifically for you, the Vet Rehabber community. Online Pet Health members get VIP complimentary access to the Vet Rehab Summit. For more information about continued education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepethealth.com.